Um, I think this is the last case study example we have. This is, again, uh, what we did for Adidas in China. Uh, earlier I spoke about the whole multi screen engagement, right? How here, when consumers are watching television, uh, they actually always have their mobile phone, they're checking things, etc. So Chinese consumers in China uh, have, are already attuned to this concept of, you know, checking their mobile phones and getting some gratification in some form. So we use that uh, to build this campaign. And what you're doing here is you're actually building engagement from mobile to a TV commercial to the brand. And two things in our outcome. One is obviously people are engaging with the TV commercial because they have to, the audio is the trigger. And second is in the back of that action, they actually get vouchers which drives them to retail. And when it has in China on their own retail, so we can actually close the loop in terms of people who engage with television and actually went into the store and bought a pair of shoes or merchandise. Marketeers, you would have seen this. 
uh, what you have on the left is a file of uh, media time spent. And clearly more than 44 percent of the time uh, is spent online. Now this is a global chart, but I don't expect this to be any different in Indonesia. It might be 40 percent, but with what's happening in mobile, it's significant. And then you have the e-commerce stock, right? Global digital buy will spend an average of thousand two hundred something dollars. So you can see this is Asia and it should be overtakes. So there, there is a great opportunity to look at you know all these people spending time online on the mobile devices and leaving them to commerce, right? I realize not all of you have e-commerce, uh, but then it's a question of defining what is the engagement you want, right? So um, sorry. Search, you know, I think that this is something which would have been talked about a lot in the morning. Search is a great lead indicator, okay? So, uh, this is an example when we're looking at, uh, this is data from Google, uh, and you're looking at weeks after launch of smartphones, uh, and here you're looking at one of these lines is search volume query, and this is the unit sales. So, um, a lot of times we are actually planning based on intent. Not just for your client's brands, not just for our client's brands, but for the category. Are you ready in search to actually make sure that you convert that demand? Not always. The flip side is you can actually capitalize on your competitor's uh, demand. Traditionally, if say, I don't know, the competitor brand launches a big campaign, you say, oh, we need to get some media budget, we need to do something. Actually, you can turn search on because when people search for a brand, it doesn't matter if it is Apple or Nokia, it creates a lot of intent, lots of volume for the whole category. And you can get a share of that file. So interestingly, what we're doing with search is basically ensure that you know, it's being planned in such a way that it aligns to your online campaigns, as well as it aligns to your competitive activity, so that you can capitalize on demand. Um, so typically, we also take it to the next stage where we are able to build some models using econometrics. One of the challenges, right, and traditionally, uh, I've done a lot of work in the area of marketing and modeling. Asia tends to be challenged when it comes to good sales data, especially the frequency of sales data, right? In markets like Australia, we get scanner data, we get weekly or sometimes even daily data. Now that's not available. So in all of these categories, search is a good surrogate for sales data, right? But then once you've established that there's a strong correlation, you can then actually model on search data. So what you would typically do is you have your marketing activities, that is your search intent, you're using your bit of your historical data to predict the future. Now this chart shows just a snapshot of what you should be looking at when you're looking at social listening. Um, here's an example, we use Meltwater if you're looking at the smartphone category. Uh, four things which we look at to start with. How much of conversation is happening? What is the sentiment of these conversations? Where are the conversations happening? Are they happening on Facebook? Are they happening on Twitter? Are they happening on forums? Uh, and finally, who are the people talking about this? I think what is important when it comes to social is, yes, it's all about class. It's all about advocacy. And good advocacy actually generates very strong net promoter score, right? I think of the main study which said that you know, potential double your business you have good advocacy, it's phenomenal. So, but what is important is, like say, on Twitter, I probably have, I don't know, 500 followers. I'm not good enough, because if I say something, it's not going to reach enough people. So you want to make sure that you're talking to influential people. And there are marketers who are using this, again, the way we use social is to keep listening every day. And this whole era of real-time marketing is about what is called news jacket. Right? And you all possibly hear about the Oreo case study, uh, which was, you know, when the Super Bowl blackout happened, they were ready with the campaign, something with less than 24 hours, right? They said you can dump the Oreo even in the dark. So um, the thing is to listen to what is happening. And currently we're doing this real-time tracking for an FMCG client, again, a hotspot target audience. Uh, and what is great is, again, like I said, when it comes to social, try not to think about the brand. Think about what is going to be interesting for the consumers. They really engage with us. So social, one good example is something which Oreo and Kit Kat did. 
obviously both of them were uh, listening. Now, I don't think you can read this clearly, so I'm just going to read out what's happening here. Um, so just what happened was starting with Ruthless Consumer, uh, that was the post from KitKat. Um, Laura obviously was thrilled that she got a response to a post, so she said, oh my god, uh, what did she say? I'm ready to tell it. She said, uh, oh my god, I don't have it, right? And then Oreo responded saying, sorry KitKat, we couldn't resist, uh, give Oreo a break. You know the famous KitKat thing, like give, give us a break. They broke the, um, this thing and they stuck Oreo. So if you look at it, this is a great example of real time marketing, right? This thing got no news coverage, PR coverage. All they had to do, if you look at what KitKat did, they had to just give you this image. So, it, it's a great example of real time marketing. We see a lot of this with clients, and we're doing this for a lot of clients. But what is the important foundation for this is to be listening to what is being said about your brands and businesses so that you can then respond in real time. There are a lot of social platforms which let you do this. Uh, and you can not just listen, but you can engage as well. Most social platforms let you do this. So the third part of you know this whole area of real time is mental. I think I just came in just before live, just before your section, Michael, but it was great discussion about RTD uh, and you know how you can actually look at it. So obviously your customers are moving from one place to another. They're going from our website, they've read a blog, etc. So if you look at what is called a signal you necessarily it requires data from four key buckets. Okay, the first is the ad server data. Second is the container tags, which is all the tagging which you use across the sites and all your material. Any bit management tools which you use in the four key <coughs> right? Which is it could be on nature, it could be Google Analytics. So the thing is to understand how you actually get a good second view of the customers. You might just go with two of these to actually give you that view. The advantage of this is attribution. Okay, attributing which of the channels perform best for your marketing efforts. Now traditionally, if you look at the current approach, uh, especially in Asia, you attribute the success to the last click, right? What this means is that, suppose I saw a display ad, suppose I'm buying a ticket for simple device. I saw a display ad, I clicked on the display ad, went to the website, and purchased the ticket. So what simple understanding is great, the display ad is working brilliantly because I clicked on the display ad, and that sale of $500 of the ticket attributed to the display, because that was the starting point. So if you look at all your typical listings, typically if you're looking at online display, which is going to get this build up time. So if you look at PPC, which is search, uh, a lot of last clicks, but no assists, right? That's the way you would look at it, right? Uh, so 90% of the sales happen within 17 days of the first digital touch. This is where the most post impression window is. So I say 17 days in the first digital touch. So we are looking at how far back did, we, did they engage online with a piece of communication from the business, right? Uh, so on and so forth. So for instance, you can get data on prospects. The prospects are more likely to search four to eight days after having been exposed to the last display and optimize here after a big display campaign. So this, this actually lets you actually change your marketing mix do things in real time once you get this information. Yeah. Um, bringing it all together, you know, I think one of the things with digital is the overload of data. There's lots of metrics, lots and lots of data. And one of the things we try to come up with is a scorecard. Now the shape of the scorecard can be different for clients. Two things, right? The website is an important part of digital marketing efforts. Um, and we work with something called an HQE index, okay? And HQE stands for High Quality Engagement. What we say is, you know, you get a lot of data on traffic, bounce rates, and whatnot. Yes, that's all important for hygiene, but what you need to look at is, what are the three actions you want your customers to take once they come onto your website, okay? 
which is defining those KPIs. And we say that it's, it's like, look at the metrics which matter. It could be that you want them to watch a video. It could be that you want them to download a brochure. It could be something else. We define these metrics and that forms the digital okay? We don't look at everything else. We need the clients don't look at everything else. So we do this across clients, so like I said, you know, Nokia, GM, Pampers, if Pampers, PNG, we look at ROI proxies. So we say one of the things about digital marketing is that like, well, we want to spend a lot on digital marketing, but it's a challenge because especially in Asia, we don't do e-commerce, we don't know what's the returns. What we're able to do with research and insight is identify what is the business value if somebody actually clicks on a search ad. If somebody actually reads one of your blog posts, what's the business value? And then you can actually come up with a sales metric of what the returns are. Bringing it all together, here's an example of what we look at, like in this little brand, which is socially skewed. So we look at things like you know, community size, um, social listening produces, what is the extent of bus, what is the engagement happening. On Facebook, we would look at people talking about it, sentiment, influence, share factor. As I said, you know, advocacy is all about people sharing your content. A lot of times we, we talk about socializing the website, right? You spend a lot of marketing dollars sending your customers to your website. Then you have your Facebook share options. Ask yourself, is there any content on your website which your customers would like to share on their Facebook feeds? Most often not because a lot of it is product information. So increasingly what we're doing is we're creating social real estate within the websites so that people you create share worthy content. So share, looking at what kind of content is being shared is very important. <coughs> All of this is best for your competitors. So we look at, okay, if you're looking at smartphones, if you're looking at beauty brands, if you're looking at automotive. So that's bringing it all together in a nice simple way. One of the things, you know, is that we talk about this connecting the dots, right? We talk about this whole thing called ecosystem planning. Now, typically, in the marketing industry now, you know, you know you have bought on the earned media, right? So what we call it paid on the earned media, which is those three buckets here. And then this is a typical life cycle of a launch marketing campaign which you have. What we let look at doing is creating advocacy at each stage of the process and ensuring that this advocacy is going on to your own platforms. Okay, be your website, be your partner website. So connecting these dots is important, you know. If not, if you're not really measuring the effectiveness of a piece of engagement to something which is transaction led. So look at it as an ecosystem and you know, ask yourself, so you've got a TV camera. You've got a mobile app, you did something to link this all up. When you got a restore, you did something to link this activity up with the store. Yeah? So that's that's an important way to look at it. So that brings me to the end of this session. So uh, just to summarize, I think you know, I talk about three things. One is the convergence framework. So the four forces which are driving this whole real-time marketing approach. Second is I show you some case studies of how we're using new technologies to connect the dots. And the third is everything that you can do with this data, but you know, I think if there's one message I would like to leave you with, it is focus on metrics that matter. Less is more, if you really want to win. So think about not more than what my colleague says, not more than two KPIs. You can do that. You are succeeded in this of the way forward. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, next Uh, I think we'll just have uh, two questions uh, due to the time limit. Maybe one from this side and the other from the other end of the room because from this morning, I don't think we have any questions from the other end of the room. So, apa ada pertanyaan dari ujung sebelah sana? Okay, uh, afternoon sir. Uh, actually, my question about how we... Uh, sorry, I checked my hand. How we designing our ecosystem? How we planning our ecosystem? So, should we... Uh, passing to all of the phase, I mean, for, uh, start from rumor and then uh, make such kind of announcement, relaunch and launch, uh, and then sustain and should we pass uh, or take all of the phase and considering about your experience, how much usually it takes time? 
for example, if it is a new brand, or we want uh, some, uh, for example, we want to launch uh, a new product. Um, I think in terms of uh, those stages, right, what I put forward, that's, that's like a bit generic, but it applies to most products, especially if it's a large product. I think where social comes in is creating that rumor. Okay? There are some categories that are so much more important, like smartphones. So smartphones, uh, the bus or the launches happen almost three months before, right? And some of them is marketing led, a lot of them are gimmicks, right? You've heard about people living their Apple phones and pubs. So that creates a lot of rumors. Uh, the way I look at it is it needs to be something which is always on, right? You have your campaigns, uh, but you need to keep creating buzz for your products. And to do that, you need to have an always on strategy. So that would be based on identifying the theme which is relevant to your consumers. It could be about music, it could be about, if you're looking at all the work which Coke is doing with music, that's the always on strategy. I have the Coke studio for instance. Um, so in terms of timing, it depends, you know, it depends on how big the launch is. Uh, so typically, I would plan at least two months before. I would start the planning at least two months before the campaign begins. Does that answer your question? Uh, actually, from my experience, very rarely we have more than two months. You know, we a lot of times we're working for within four weeks. Uh, so. Two months is enough. Again, it depends the scale of what you're doing. Right? We're assuming that a lot of basic setup and social etc. already exists. So then you're just ensuring that you're creating the teaser campaign which creates that buzz. Uh, so two months I think is a realistic time from a marketing perspective. Assuming you have product launch created much before. Thanks for that. I am my Okay. Um